I'm Ollie Flower. This is a Petra Kutcher specifically about cerebral vasospasm following aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's part of a five Petra Kutcher series discussing aneurysmal subarach. I'll talk about terminology, pathology, risk factors, diagnosis and management within the limits of a Petra Kutcher. Vasospasm is a feared and potentially devastating complication of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Narrowing or vasospasm of the angiographically visible cerebral arteries after subarachnoid hemorrhage is common in up to 70% and it occurs 3 to 15 days after aneurysm rupture but most frequently after 7 to 10 days. It resolves spontaneously after 21 days and it can lead to delayed cerebral ischemia. The language we use when discussing vasospasm is important and can be confusing. Vasospasm is a radiological diagnosis just descriptive. Delayed neurological deterioration encompasses clinically detectable neurological deterioration post subarachnoid hemorrhage after stabilization but not due to rebleeding. Some common causes include delayed cerebral ischemia, hydrocephalus, cerebral edema, fevers, seizures or electrolyte abnormalities. Delayed cerebral ischemia which occurs in up to 40% of patients is the consequence that we fear and the leading cause of secondary morbidity. The term is applied to any neurological deterioration presumed related to ischemia that persists for more than an hour and cannot be explained by other physiological abnormalities. The terminology matters because if DCI and DND terms are used interchangeably, then you can't compare treatments in trials, you can't develop evidence-based guidelines, and there's an inappropriate tendency to combine radiological evidence of vascular narrowing and clinical findings into a single definition. So who actually gets vasospasm? Well, the amount of blood in the head and where it's located is the key factor. So the radiological graining scales of Fisher and Clarsen are the key predictors. Particularly thick basal cystin blood and blood in the lateral ventricles predicts vasospasm. Other risk factors include poor clinical grade, longer duration of unconsciousness after aneurysm rupture, youth with age less than 50, hyperglycemia, hypertension, smoking, cocaine use and genetics. The type of therapy chosen, i.e. clipping versus coiling, does not appear to influence risk. So the cascade of events culminating the arterial narrowing starts when oxyhemoglobin comes in contact with the abluminal side of the vessel. There are calcium dependent and independent pathways involved, free radical reactions and an imbalance between vasoconstrictor and vasodilator substances, particularly nitric oxide, endothelin and arachidonic acid metabolites. There's also an upheaval of neuronal mechanisms that regulate vascular tone, endothelial proliferation and aptosis. Diagnosis of DCI can often be tricky. Although serial neurological examinations are important, they're of limited sensitivity in patients with poor clinical grade. If there's a deterioration, then you usually need another diagnostic test. Obviously, diagnostic approach needs to be tailored to your clinical situation. To detect vasospasm, digital subtraction angiogram is still the gold standard, giving the best real-time imaging of small and large vessels and allowing concurrent treatment if required. CTA is nearly as sensitive. MRA is pretty good, but logistically harder. Transcranial Dopplers are reasonable for large vessels but have many limitations. There are emerging data that perfusion imaging, demonstrating regions of hypoperfusion, may be more accurate for identification of DCI than anatomic imaging of arterial narrowing. Perfusion CT is a promising technology, although repeat measurements are limited by the risks of the contrast and radiation exposure. Other diagnostic modalities exist, which as part of multimodal monitoring may help detect vasospasm early. These are used predominantly in a research capacity at the moment and include continuous EEG, which helps demonstrate a reduced flow, ischemia and seizure activity, brain tissue oxygenation monitoring and cerebral microdialysis catheters. Early vasospasm is an entity, a radiological arterial narrowing present at the time or shortly after hospital admission present in up to 10% of patients. It's more likely if you've got a poor neurological grade and lots of blood in the head, bigger aneurysms, IVH. It's not associated with conventional vasospasm and it's an independently poor prognostic marker. Nimodipine, a calcium channel blocker. The only therapy that's been proven to improve outcomes after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. But there's no convincing evidence that nimodipine affects the incidence of either vasospasm or delayed cerebral ischemia. Whatever the process, it does work and you should give it. Volume status. So with volume, more may be less. Triple H therapy is out. Intravascular volume management should target euvolemia as prophylactic hypervolemia therapy may harm. Hypertense with norad to a pressure that improves symptoms. Regarding the type of fluid, we don't really know what's best. 
but most people use isotonic crystalloid. Angioplasty and intraarterial treatments have become the standard of treatment for refractory vasospasm despite a lack of evidence. They're often used with concurrent intraarterial vasodilators. If you have bigger vessel vasospasm, it's more amenable to ballooning and intraarterial vasodilators are more suitable for the smaller vessels. Statins have pleiotropic biological properties providing a plausible basis for potential benefit in this context. There are a few small studies out there and a larger phase three trial codenamed STASH is in progress. Patients are on statins already, should have them continued, but statin-naive patients shouldn't be started on them until we get the results of some more trials. Magnesium got everyone excited for a while, and I know a few people who believe it's the wonder drug panacea for ICU problems. Early trials showed promise, but phase three studies have shown that whilst it may improve some surrogate endpoints, there's no benefit in functional outcomes, and its use cannot be recommended. From a practical perspective, this means one less line tied up and less hypotension to deal with. Some surgical approaches have been attempted to prevent vasospasm. They're currently considered investigational only. They include cisternal infusion of urokinase after aneurysm clipping in an effort to diminish clot size, intrathecal urokinase infusion into the cisterna magna in patients with subarach post-coiling, and early cisternal CSF washout during the operative repair. So that's the end of another Petra Kutcher. Remember, DCI kills, so fear and respect it. Have high vigilance for it clinically and radiologically. Start nemodipine as soon as possible. Avoid dehydration and treat it with euvolemia, hypertension and interventional neuroradiology.